to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's International Programs and the University of Iowa's Honors Program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also thank the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I thank today's special financial sponsors, Midwest One Bank and Cartha. Our programs are made possible by the financial support of these sponsors. I am pleased to introduce Demi Doreska, who is Director, University of Iowa Institute for International Business. He will introduce our speakers. Demi. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, David. And it's such a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And the three panelists that we have here, it was not uh, easy to select them because they are all passionate about this topic. Uh, China's influence in Africa. And they have a lot that they're going to tell you. And the way we're going to do it, I'll be the facilitator. I'll ask them questions. And each of them will receive two sets of questions. And uh, they will answer the questions. And then uh, we will uh, uh, open it up to you, the audience, to ask the questions you, you, you have for them. And the way we'll do it, when you ask the questions, uh, the audience, the other Mandela fellows in the audience will have a chance to also give their opinions on how they see China's invest, involvement in Africa. So that way, everybody will have a chance to, to voice their opinion. But I know it's such a, a neat group. I've been with them for the past four weeks, and I can tell you we're, we're going to learn a lot from them uh, today. Let's start with uh, uh, Tochuku. Tochuku is from Nigeria, and, uh, and, and he has seen it really, uh, uh, the impact of China in Africa. And the first questions I want to ask Tochuku is, uh, how long has China been involved in Africa? Thank you, Jimmy. I want to answer this question in, in three ways. I wanted to look at it, it with the pros and the cons of China's influence and investment in Africa. I also want to talk about it in why is China expanding this place in Africa. You see, for the past 30, uh, three decades now, the Infrastructure Bank of China has invested over $100 billion in Africa. China is the largest trade partner of the continent. Trade volumes over, you know, within, the, within these three decades now, from $10 billion now to about $530 billion. Wow. To be specific, a country in Africa, Kenya, it is the second largest country beneficiary of China direct investment, and they have gotten $3.5 billion. In the cons, because although we are enjoying it, but its effects in our local industry, in our workforce, is something we have to emphasize also. In South Africa, for the past uh, 15 years now, over 75,000 jobs have been lost due to China's investment in the country. In Nigeria, where I come from, the textile industries, over 80% have closed up because of the influence of China industries and materials in our country. But the, the question we are asking is why is China expanding its influence in Africa? I mean, I'm, in my own opinion, I'm looking at it like this. Does it mean that the African continent, we are gullible? Or does it mean that African com continent has provided a conducive you know, market for China to produce goods? Yet, Africa is over a billion in population. And there is this imagine of the middle class. Everybody in Africa wants to arrive. And China has seen this. So they are captivating on this, pushing their goods into Africa, and they are getting their, and they are getting their gains. So I, 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 it's, to me, it's a, it's a win-win thing. But somehow, the cons are affecting Africa now. But we believe, as Mandela fellows, that things will change in the future because we're going to deter it too, because we get the market. And somehow, because we have the market, they need us. So we're going to kind of, you know, present that option on the table, and then we'll dialogue with them, and we'll become partners. It has to be a win-win situation. Well, uh, Tochiko, you, you mentioned South Africa, you mentioned Nigeria, and also Kenya as some of the countries that China is visible. What are some of other countries that one can see Chinese presence? Okay. Starting with Guinea. 
China has developed a, a free industrial package in Guinea. Also in Guinea, China has developed a free mine. Also in Guinea, China has developed a free railway. In Nigeria, China constructed free of charge, a 100-kilometer road. In, in Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia and Angola, the, the popular Bengola Railway. Also in Nigeria, where I come from, China is building and constructing the railway that is linking the north and the south, the Kano Lagos Railway. Very good. But this is this is interesting. And uh, uh, continuing with uh, Stephanette, Stephanette Taylor is from Liberia. Uh, what I mean, I know that you could kind of touch upon on some of the characteristics of China's involvement in Africa. What are some other characteristics, and especially giving examples in your own country that we, we can point pinpoint on, on the Chinese involvement in Africa? China has its overarching interest in Africa because China, um, the first thing is China wants access to minerals and oil, most especially gas. So it is estimated by 2020, China will have imported more gas than the U.S. Another issue is that China has its big markets in Africa. China export a lot of goods to Africa and the workforce has increased in China. They, and so China wants to export a lot of goods into Africa. And another thing to look at is China wants to expand its political legitimacy. Africa has 52 countries and those 52 countries make up more than one quarter of the United Nations votes and, and, and members also. So China wants to use Africa so they could push their political agenda also. So those are this, some of the issues that yeah, China this, has. This in is Africa. interesting you are mentioning that. And... Uh, uh, some of us uh, in, in education, uh, we, we're thinking that China is using its money, and we call that financial diplomacy. And I know Ambassador Ron McMillan is in the audience, and, and he could. We call that financial. China is using its money power to influence uh, uh, the, the 52 countries in Africa so they can kind of support its uh, views in at the United Nations. But you as Africans, do you do you see that on the continent or do you kind of as young entrepreneurs, as young leaders in Africa, do you see that? Do you see that broad strategy of China that we call financial diplomacy as their involvement in Africa? Of course we do because we see that China heavy in investment in countries that I all reach like Sudan, Angola, and Nigeria. Those are countries that they invest heavily because those countries they are rich in oil and they want to like secure or guarantee their future oil supply. So we think that China is using their financial diplomacy in Africa. Okay, very good, very good. Well, Amit, we have Amit Diallo. He's from Senegal and and. Uh, very passionate about this topic. And uh, uh, Ahmed, how do Africans see Chinese involvement in Africa? How do you see it? Uh, thank you, Dimi. I would like first to make some comments regarding this event. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the people of Iowa City for hosting us and for, for making also this day joyful and exciting. Uh, talking about China is not easy and one should be careful about this issue for two reasons. First of all, a lot of things have been said about China, a lot of documentation, surveys, papers. The world most known scholars have done these studies and we should be careful or regard or some way pay attention to this. The second one is that I only see here retired people. I see Ambassador McMullen, he has a good comment of all these international relations. But anyway, as young African leaders, we hope that we will make it. So Ni Hao, as the Chinese would say, Good, <laughs> right. So, Dimi, coming back to to the to the to the question you have raised a while ago, I think that when China first came in Africa, we were not aware about the real stake of of the game at this time. Uh, back in the early nineties, China was building stadiums for free. China offered a lot of stadiums for free, like in my country in Senegal. The first stadium was offered by China in the early nineteen nineties. 
So Africans saw China at this time as a gift sent by God. As at the same time, the Western, the Western states, I mean, the West was tied in relation, asking for democracy, asking for human rights. So China came to offer another, another side of the cooperation, giving money, granting money to all the states who wanted to have partnership with them. And at this time, we did not re really uh, say what China was looking in Africa. And then the issue evolved from seeing China as uh, someone sent by God to to help Africans, we started, there was a rising awareness in Africa that China was attempting also to take all the resources that Africa have. And then there was a kind of awareness. We started asking questions of being, let's guys be more careful about China. What China want? Is China now doing uh, the exact thing that the West did 200 years ago or 100 years ago? Is China taking all our minerals? Is China taking all our oil? to proceed it in, in China and then come back to, 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 to sell it to us. That's why today a lot of young Africans and even some states in Africa has now are aware about this and want a fair deal with China. First, it was, it was an opportunity that we were not so mindful about China, but now we are, we are in on a position to, 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 to better analyze the issue and see how to take profit of China's presence in Africa. Uh, I mean, this is excellent the way you put this uh, for us. But now, when we bring this back to the United States, do you think it is too late for America to counter the Chinese presence in Africa? Or do you, do you also think U.S. companies are losing ground because of this heavy presence of China in Africa? Well, uh, this is not an easy issue, too. But I think that we have to go again and analyze the history of China's uh, arrival in Africa. So there is a kind of mindset in Africa that whenever you want goods at a very cheap price, go to the Chinese. But there is also another mindset that Chinese uh, goods, Chinese products don't last. So this is not true, of course, because China designed it for Africa only what Africa was able to, to buy. means that we are... Uh, a mostly poor continent, developing continent, our income is not so great. So just China said, just let us design for them what they can afford. At the, at the, uh, at the other side, the West do have goods, but these goods were framed in quality and they were a little bit at a higher price. So the Africans, I mean, those who are not so, so well educated, think that Chinese goods is, is equivalent to, ch to, to, to fake products. So that's why whenever you want to buy something which is in quality, you better prefer to go goods coming from Europe, coming from Germany or from the United States than going back. I mean, the intelligentsia, the middle class, those who have been educated, do make this distinction. But I think that if the United States or the West want to counter China's uh, emergence in Africa, they have to do, they have to see where China really beats the trick. I mean, uh, in terms of electronics, in terms of clothing, in terms of bringing in Africa uh, cars, infrastructure, China is doing a very great job in Africa because it is at a very cheap price. And then the medium-sized companies in the United States, if they want also to counter China's, uh, uh, China's offensive in Africa, they would have to work in these issues. How to frame, how to design for Africans, but also how to regain this market that they seem to be losing. I mean, most of scholars like the economist from Zambia, Dambizo Moyo, some of you may have heard about her. She has done lots of lectures about China and how the West is losing ground in, in Africa. But I think there is still some possibility for the United States to recounter this offensive. So you do, you, what you're saying is focusing on quality yes. and also work with the, the educated class, the growing middle class, the growing educated middle class, and, and that understands uh, the influence in China is considered as a neo-colonialism in a different form, right? So you're saying the American companies should focus on quality and cooperation with the new educated middle class. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, of course. It's, it so sounds like this because uh, the, what Africans has realized so far was that China wanted an, a sac a kind of second colonization after the Western colonization. And this Africa cannot afford. We have had a false start when, during the Western imperialism. We cannot have another false start 
As that Kenyan writer and activist Wangari Matai said, Africa don't have another time to board on a wrong bus. Because she thinks that Africa was boarding on a wrong bus since the years we got independence. So with China, if we again board on a, on a wrong bus, instead of going to Morin, Morin City, we'll be going to Muscatine or maybe to Kalana. And this is not <laughs> a good direction. So, so people do prefer, I, I mean in terms of trust, Chinese, when they came in Africa, you know, we, we like to treat with China, but also in Senegal, for instance, they will tell you that China's companies, when they came in Senegal, they don't use the local workforce at the beginning. Now the state is demanding that they should use the local workforce. But at the beginning, they would bring their food, they would bring their, their workforce, they would bring everything for them. So that the, when in Senegal, they don't need anything outside. Everything they consume, they bring from China. And this we did not want because we want also when you are a partner in our country also to, 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 to energize our companies, to energize our food market, to energize everything that we have. This is a kind of winning winning cooperation. And this is what we are looking for China. And this is what we should be looking for every partner now in Africa. Very good. Because that's a question I was going to ask to each and every one of you. How do you, you cannot just kick all the Chinese out. Yes. Right. So you're talking about integration. You're talking about global commerce. You need the Chinese, but how do you define the relationship? How, as young leaders in Africa, I want each of you to kind of how you see the new partnership with China. Thank you, Jimmy. Once again, I think the, 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 the investment climate now needs to change because before now, when Chinese came into Africa, like I said before, it seems to be that our government were weak and it actually was not that strong. And it seems that they were throwing the bait and the African continent, our leader, were taking it. But for now, as young African leaders, we know that we, have the, we are on the strength path because we got the market. We over one billion. This is one billion market for anything produced and you want to sell it in Africa. So what we are looking at now, an investment climate, where we see ourselves as partners. Because of then, it was like they are throwing the options at the table, but we are just accepting because we needed their funds, we needed, we needed their development. But for now, what we are looking at, that everything anybody wants to do in African continent has to be in terms of partnership. We cannot be, we bring up options, we bring up options, we find a way that the romance will be sweet and then beneficiary to the two uh, parties. Very good, Tochuko. How about you, Stephanette? How do you see the cooperation with China? How do you want it to be? I think in Africa, the problem is implementation. There are good laws, but we are very weak on implementations. The government make the laws, but there is no one to implement it. There are, <clears throat> I think that there should be rules and there should be guidelines as to what are, China, what are the Chinese rules and what are the rules of the Liberian government or the African government as a whole. And I think China has helped Africa in a way because we can't just look at only what China wants. They they want something, and we want something too. They've helped us with in infrastructures. They have t t um, built hospitals for us. They have constructed roads, and they have done a whole lot for the African co continent. But I think our leaders should be able to set these rules, and they should also be able to implement them. What are our rules, and what we expect of the Chinese government? So. All right. So you want the you want this to be a true joint venture, not uh, 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 where China dictates the rules. Okay. Well, um, we can take some questions. I mean, I have a whole lot of other questions I'd like to ask, but uh, I want this to be really a dialogue. And I know you have your question cards. I can start answering some of them or asking some of them. Uh, uh, the first question we have. Does any, some of the other Mandela fellows in the audience, feel free to chime in. If you raise your hand, you'll come forward and I'll give you the microphone so you can answer. Uh, uh, this question is uh, maybe for anybody who wants to answer. Does China provide jobs for Africans or do they employ more Chinese? Or do Chinese investments reach the people? So this question is all about the impact. Do they provide jobs? Do they employ only Chinese? or do investments do that impact the people? We have Adama Jakite in the back from Guinea. Could you come forward, Adama, so you can use the microphone, please? He's gonna answer the question. Yeah, come here. 
thank you, Dimi. Uh, I start to to thank uh, all people who are coming here. Uh, uh, my country was uh, in first country in West uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa to establish a diplomatic relationship with China. So you know more the Chinese, you know more about the relations with Chinese than many other African countries. As my colleague uh, fellow said, uh, to answer the question, I can give you one example today. Uh, when uh, I try to inform uh, about uh, the news from my country, I show the new announcement about the job announcement from uh, the new hotel built by China company. And they ask about 500 jobs in the hotel uh, tourism sector. That is mean that China's, even they, they come with a uh, Chinese expert or Chinese uh, to, to, to build the infrastructure in Africa, but they create two the jobs. I can give you one another example. Last year, Chinese helped our country to build the biggest dam in electricity with for 500 megawatts, who satisfy, which satisfy now 1,500% of our, our electricity needs. And they create job too for the people who are in, in, involved in the electrical sector. That is mean that it is not Chinese who do who do all the job in Africa. Maybe the the design, the conception, and the the high schools. It is Chinese, but they try to to transfer the knowledge. That is the question I I, I want to answer. Okay, well, yeah. thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Um, this question is for Stephanette. How does China impact your work? As a, you are a banker, you are a controller, right? So how does China impact your work? And do not, do the Chinese interact with the average person in uh, in your country in Liberia? Sure, they do. Um, because the Chinese, they in my country, most often they are involved with construction, so they interact with with most of the Liberians, they use them as a part of their workforce. So they interact. For me personally, because I run a microfinance entity, so I don't really interact with the Chinese because I provide loans for emerging Liberian businesses and agricultural cooperatives. So I don't really interact with them. We don't do business. Okay, very good. Um, the next question we have, uh, what has China's entry with cheap goods affected? Uh, does, do they affect uh, the local indigenous handicrafts, the, the, the micro-level entrepreneurs, uh, the cheap goods in China? Who do they affect the most? And uh, I see so many hands, but I'm going to take Dave. Dave uh, is from uh, Kenya, and Dave will come forward and answer the questions. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Demi, for this opportunity. Now, um, Chinese products, as the mentality is back in Africa, is that they are cheap. But the question is, as Africans and as young entrepreneurs, where do we get the alternative? We don't have. And the West has not been able to provide that cheap alternative or that alternative to the cheap machines so that we can start our businesses. I'll give you a typical example. I am involved in animal feed manufacturing. My first equipment I bought from Chinese, Chinese manufacturer. And if I compare the Chinese manufacturer and the German manufacturer, the Chinese were cheap. But this equipment that I'm using now has been able to run my business and I've been able to use it to serve the market that I needed to serve. So, uh, Yes, Chinese products are cheap, but the cheapness is helping us to 
impact the society that we need to do. Now, right now, I'm considering upgrading my equipment from small to big. So at this stage, I have to gauge, do I still go back to the Chinese or do I go back to the American equipment or to the European equipment? Now, that's a very difficult decision to make because uh, uh, if you are comparing it from a micro level, the impact that you're going to create is that if you get a quality product from Europe or America or Germany, then it will be able to last you long, and so you can serve the mass. But if you get a cheap product from China, you will still be able to do the same, but what guarantee do you have that you are still going to be able to create impact? Another good example is uh, mathematical sets that students or pupils use in Kenya to study. All of them come from China, and that's a, that's a great impact. Students are able to draw, they are able to use them to do the mathematics, and that's a, great, a very big impact. Cheap Chinese products are creating in, uh, in a typical uh, African society. So I don't think the issue is really about cheap or expensive. The issue is what can Africans afford? And in this case, Chinese are, fri are providing for Africa what they can afford to create the impact they need to create in their society. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, the, the, the next question I have here, uh, uh, China seems to know what it wants out of its relationship with African countries. But uh, do African governments know what they want out of their relationship with China? Let's get Chipo. Chipo is from Zimbabwe. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to be present here. Uh, to answer that question, I would look at my country, Zimbabwe. When we started trading with uh, China, I think our government didn't know what it was in store for them. Maybe they didn't really look at it, uh, that what, are they, what is the Chinese bringing on the table. We just discovered uh, diamonds in our country, and we did not have the equipment to actually uh, extract the diamonds, process the diamonds, polish, and uh, China was there for us. You know, it say that it is going to come with all the equipment that we want. It will go to China to process them, and would also benefit. So that was to us a win-win for all of us. But then five years down the line, uh, China came. It was using all the expertise from China. It was not teaching our geologists or um, the people in our country how to do the same. And uh, we found out that after five years, we have not gained from our diamonds. It's like we don't even have diamonds in that country. We're actually better off when we didn't have those diamonds than now because uh, our government just told us this year that they cannot account for $15 billion, which is worth of, uh, about f uh, five years' growth of the country um, because the Chinese were actually taking that money to their country. Um, for Zimbabwe, we use uh, the US dollar. So I think for China, they knew that if they had to come to Zimbabwe, they will benefit from the US dollar. So um, our governments, I think they, they, have, they, they did not draw up what they really wanted in that uh, partnership. So instead, we are getting all these cheap goods and um, they're getting the US dollar. So we get a good, uh, uh, like, a pair of slippers, maybe for five dollars, but it's not in fact worth five dollars. It's just a way of getting the U.S. dollar back to China. So this is what I have to say about our relationship right now. Thank you very much. Um, the next question I have here uh, is: uh, What percentage of the 1.2 billion? Uh, residents of Africa that you, you consider are part of the middle class? What is the percentage, and uh, roughly? And then how do you define middle class in the context of Africa? Uh, because it can be very different. Middle class in the U.S., middle class in Africa is totally different. In the context of Africa, what do you guys consider middle class? Yeah, in, in Africa, what we consider middle class are people that have their, you know, income that is above a hundred dollars monthly because because several africans are still be living below the poverty line and then the percentage is over 70 percent 
while the, the, the upper class is, is about 3%, then the lower class is about 30%. Because of so many things that has happened in the past three decades, like I said before, our agricultural, input, agricultural production has increased uh, due to, yes, influence of China again. The civilization is also increasing. And then people are becoming aware. People are getting more educated. So when you, when you consider the poverty as defined by the World Bank, if you uh, live on less than a dollar a day, you, you consider poor. By, that's the classical definition of poverty by the World Bank. And then, so if you move from that to $100 a month, so you are in, in, in the context of Africa again. There is not one definition of middle class. You are considered to be part of the middle class. And then the Chinese, they are making products for that uh, market. So um, uh, financial aids to African countries often has strings attached and one of which involves human rights. The Chinese, they don't have strings attached. Mm -hmm. no. So what do you think about that? And uh, which approach is better for Africa? Strings attached, no strings attached. Which approach? <laughs> let's, take, let, let's, let's take Nalitumba from Zambia. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dimi, for the opportunity. Now, there is something interesting about the investment that is being done in Africa. Now, the investment which China is offering has also a huge negative impact on Africa. Because if they invest, maybe to foster just to extract oil and uh, minerals for the sake of maybe the few in government, and the, the rest of the country remain poor. And this is the biggest problem. In Africa, we have all the resources we can boast of. And much of the things that are being done in the world, the, the equipment, most of the materials are coming to Africa. But the problem is, because of the, of the knowledge vacuum which is there, so the, the, the few who know the benefit and the value will make decisions based on what they can get and leave the majority to suffer. And therefore, if an investment come without these strings attached to help the masses, then we should not go for it. Why should we go for an investment which has no strings attached? They say, if you offer us uh, 500 acres of minerals, you and your family will be rich. The rest of 10,000 will be in poverty. Then it makes sense. But if you have an investment, we're going to invest. But before we invest, we want to see gender equality. We need uh, sustainable development. The, env the environment should not be polluted. After mining, what next? What are the health hazards? And how do we go around, uh, around those health hazards? When we begin to, 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 to mine, let's say if, uh, if our, our emission will be sulfur, how do we trap it before it goes in the air? So these are the important things that African leaders need to begin to analyze. And therefore, as Mandela Washington fellows, we are looking forward to begin to revisit these such kind of agreements so that the betterment of Africa we should now begin to move forward. Believe you me, there is nothing wrong with an African, but the problem is with the African mindset. And this is the mindset that we want to challenge now so that we begin to do things right. It's like, we are, well, we are in a political campaign, so. <laughs> very good, Nali Tumba, very good. So, um, again, in the same context, do African countries work with each other? Do they have uh, economic union? Do, do they work with each other? Uh, Adama, we have you before already, but I'm going to take uh, Saloum instead. Saloum. Saloum is from Tanzania. Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Saloum Azim and I'm, I'm pleased to be, to be here this afternoon. Uh, as for the question, uh, 
Yeah, to some extent, we can say uh, Africans work to each other. We have uh, we have uh, uh, political in integration, like the SADC. Uh, we have uh, EAC, East African Un uh, Community. We have SADC. We have COMESA. So they do work each other. But the uh, question comes on the matter of um, uh, member interests. Each countries have different interests on these. Uh, on this uh, community, uh, community integration. So they do really work on each other, but the issue comes on interest of each country on their, on their community integration. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. Yeah, no problem, very good. Um, uh, now, uh, there's a question with regards uh, to language in, 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 in China. In, in Africa. Now, when Chinese interact with African people, do they communicate in English, French, or the local languages? Or do the African people have to learn Chinese? Uh, let's take Jean. Jean back there. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, Chinese, to approach people, they don't need uh, a very standardized language. They speak little French. They know some verbs to approach to people. <laughs> and they don't need to conjugate. They don't need ta the tenses. They just, for instance, I can tell you about uh, French. They say, uh, amener uh, uh, téléphone téléphone la famille <laughs> arja 200 200 that's it in french if it's in english they don't need to speak good english they say okay me chinese telephone original communication 200 200 you know french 200 dollars that's all. I mean, they, they are good, they are good businessmen and they, they know what people want. And I would like to give as a, a suggestion, Chinese didn't succeed because of much intelligence, but they know what people need and they go to the root of the, of the society. They, most of Europeans and I can say America is not very well known unless through US aid and uh, some other NGOs. So s they know what people need. But uh, in terms of quality, no. I mean, in, in our language, we, we have a saying that says, the beauty of a cow is to be one. But if you get to compare it to others, then the beauty is questionable. <laughs> so it's because you don't come. If you come, you can chase the Chinese. If a European comes, they can chase the Chinese, but they don't have this opportunity to arrive to the very root of the community. Please, if you, for us all uh, and for you all, let's go to the grassroots, the roots of the community, and they communicate with the very people. Because uh, when we are a hundred percent of the population, only ten percent are intellectuals, uh, and the whole other population is uh, very, I mean, uh, very uneducated people. So, but if you want to make a business, you must approach the majority of the population. And those ones need to communicate, need uh, the products. So we, we need to go back to the roots of the community if you want to cooperate and have a much impact. And if you, we want China to, to be like other countries or to be chased away. Thank you. First of all, to thank Demi Doreska and our Mandela Washington fellows, so round, round of applause. I want to thank our sponsors, uh, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we thank our today's financial sponsors, Midwest One Bank and Cartha. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available for viewing audiences. And as, my, as our final uh, token of appreciation, uh, we want to present our three speakers with our coveted 
Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.